desiring to be with us, desiring to touch every person in this place, or to heal, minister, that maybe do so convicting the Lord, just challenging us to be better men, better women. Molded and shaped more in your image, Father. So for that we say there is no one like you, God. We would pray that you would be honored and glorified in every aspect of our service. This gorgeous day that you bless us with. We love you, we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask all of these things. And all of God's children said, Amen. We praise the Lord. Wonderful to see you. See lots of new people here this morning. Maybe take a moment to uh, wander around and introduce yourself to them. Good morning, everyone. How is the church body doing today? Oh, excellent. So glad to see all of you. I'm glad to be back from vacation. Jillian and I, uh, we just got to a point where we thought we need to come home, and we need to come home in short order. So um, looking forward to studying the Word with all of you as Pastor Phil uh, continues on in the book of Ephesians. We're certainly going to continue doing that. We're also going to continue worship in a time of prayer. Uh, but before we go any further, I do have some announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention. And also, if anyone is new and visiting our fellowship this morning, we are certainly blessed to have you here. We want to put our hands together and welcome you. Amen. So excited to be able to join in worshiping the Lord with all of you. Now, to those aforementioned uh, announcements and each one of these has a bulletin insert with it so you can follow along with me certainly the first one I want to address is towards the men uh, we are continuing on in our men at work uh, July 14th we are going to be doing that and we want to encourage you men to come on out number one and also number two secondly if you know of anyone that needs work accomplished in their house or on their property please make us aware of that it would be uh, upsetting to us if we had a bunch of men gathered together and nothing to do. That just would not make sense. So please let us know how we might be able to serve people because it is our desire to wash feet and to fulfill the Great Commission outside of these four walls and just to be able to love on people with the love that Jesus Christ has shown us. So men, please come out for that. Uh, secondly, abide camping. So this is regarding, for all you parents that have junior hires and middle schoolers, we are going to be uh, hosting our abide camping trip 2012 from July 13th and 15th. This is just a reminder to make sure to get your students registered. You'll notice the bulletin insert has a registration card located on it, and you can uh, uh, tear those off and put them in the uh, tithes and offerings box located at the back of the sanctuary. Now, another um, school that is going to take place in short order happens to be VBS, and this is regarding our children's ministry, our Creator God. And you will also notice that there's a registration form attached to this bulletin as well. And plus, in addition to that, we now have registration online at our website at southhillcalvary.org. You can register your children there. And also, a little bonus, we have um, uh, put in place the ability to sponsor a child. So if the Lord puts a particular little one on your heart and you'd like to be able to bless them and help them to be able to attend VBS, we would encourage you to be obedient to the Lord and to do that and to go onto the website and make sure that you sponsor a child. And then also, if you want to uh, do the paper registration, you can certainly drop it off uh, as well uh, in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, I think I have two others that I want to mention as I'm finishing up, and then I'll pass it over to Pastor Jason, who has an announcement to make. Uh, and, and this one is regarding the Be Anxious for Nothing. 
Uh, we want to continue on, and it is certainly a privilege for the eldership to be able to pray on your behalf, but also to pray on the behalf of other people that you know uh, need help. We want to uh, make supplication to our Lord for you and for them. And also, I would highly encourage you, um, it is our desire to glorify the Lord. And if you also have any prayer, uh, not prayer requests, excuse me, but praise reports, uh, what the Lord's doing in your life or the life of somebody else, please let us know that as well so we can all be encouraged together as the body of Christ. And you can also turn those in at the back of the sanctuary. And then lastly, um, summer nights is coming up for Wednesday evenings. And if you remember, if you've been to, uh, if you've actually experienced somehow in some way summer here in the Pacific Northwest, it looks like we actually have some sunshine right now. Uh, you'll know that on Wednesday nights after the Word of God, we spend time in fellowship and breaking of bread, having popcorn, and we go through various snacks and ice cream bars and things of that nature. And, and so we want to remind you that it's coming up. But most importantly, we'd love the opportunity to serve alongside you and also to have you uh, bring some of those snacks if that's something that the Lord is putting on your heart. Uh, Mark Bethune and I will be leading up summer nights, uh, and we would consider it a privilege to be able to serve alongside of you. And so if you wouldn't mind filling that out, if that's something the Lord's putting on your heart, uh, we'll, we'll be able to contact you and put you on the schedule. Even if it's just one night, uh, we'd love for you to be able to participate in that. And now I'll turn it over to Pastor Jason uh, to talk a little bit about the missions dinner. Yes, as you can tell by the lovely decorations and the flags, today is our annual missions dinner which is gonna take place uh, this afternoon from 4.30 to 7.30. And this is the one time a year where as a church, we all gather together to um, enjoy fellowship, enjoy awesome food, and uh, enjoy pinata bashing uh, for kids and adults. It's always intense when the adults get in there, they'll whack the pinata around. Um, we have a, a cake walk for, for the kids. We have a silent auction. All of these things that are covered right now, they'll actually be removed afterwards so you can begin sort of pre-grazing and looking around, seeing what you want to bid on. We have a live auction. And all of this is to go towards the missions, the missionaries that we support, the works that God has allowed us as a church to be a part of. Uh, right now, our pastor and his wife, Jenny, they're, they're traveling Europe and strengthening some of our missionaries in Hungary, in Croatia, in Germany. And so part of the money is going to go to them. Uh, our brother Aaron Weems just got back from Mexico. Welcome back, man. Glad you're safe. Uh, we're taking a team down in a few weeks uh, to build an addition onto the church. So part of the money is going to go there. Our dear Chris Rep is here with us today. Uh, yeah, praise the Lord. Before we knew that she was going to be here, actually our cake walk, it's normally a sombrero walk, but this year it's where in the world is Chris Rett. But she's here, so we'll figure out how that's going to happen. But the other thing that we are most excited about is that not only is Chris Rep going to be here, we're going to get to hear from her, but, but via technology and the hard work of, of Brad working with the missionaries, we're actually going to get to talk with them online uh, via the web and they're going to be up here on the big screen and we're going to be able to talk with them in their country. Isn't that awesome? So that'll just be a sweet time at six o'clock. We're going to hear from uh, Pastor Ivan and, and our pastor who's there uh, in Austria. We're going to have to limit our pastor because we really want to hear from Ivan, not him. So we'll show him a little love at the beginning and then if he starts talking, Brad has the signal to just, you know, oops, technical difficulties. Then at 6.30, uh, uh, shoot, who's at 6.30? Uh, ben, ben and Emily, Spectre from Croatia. All these missionaries are getting up between 3 and 4 in the morning to be with us um, over, over the Internet. Praise the Lord for that. So they're going to share a little bit. And then at 7 or 7.15-ish, Frank and Judy from Germany, we're going to get to hear from them and what the Lord's doing. So this is sort of the mother of all missions dinners that you don't want to miss. Um, the tickets are seven dollars for a single uh, individual, or four dollars, or excuse me, twenty. Thank you, Casey. Twenty-five dollars for family of four or more. There we go. Say that ten times fast. And um, great food, great fellowship, great music, just an awesome time together. And so we'd love to have you. Tickets are on sale in the foyer if you haven't gotten them yet. And uh, we'd love to see you here at 4.30.
Amen. Thank you, sir. For, for a second, I thought you were just arbitrarily making up prices for people. He was like, eh, 24 bucks. All right. Looking forward to uh, hearing what the Lord is going to do. Really excited to hear from the missionaries. Amen. That is an absolute blessing that we'll be able to do that. Uh, and I know the Lord is going to speak through them directly into our hearts. Uh, and he's going to do that as well uh, when we listen from Pastor Phil in the Word of God today. Um, and we don't want to be distracted by what he wants to speak to us. And, and in that vein, if you have any cell phones or other electronic devices, it is a good idea uh, to silence those as necessary. Uh, we completely understand if you need to leave during the teaching of God's Word, we want to have you back in the sanctuary uh, so we can finish up. It just always helps if you seat yourselves in the last few rows, and it looks like there's plenty of room back there. If you have any questions about that or want to be directed to an overflow room, there's always ushers in the back of the sanctuary, and it is their privilege and their desire to be able to serve you uh, in that regard. And now let's bow our heads and pray that the Lord would bless the time that we have together. Uh, Father, thank you so much for all that you're doing in our midst. Uh, we just uh, are excited because we can see your hand in our, in our lives, Lord. And there is no greater blessing than that. Just to know that we are your children, that you desire to have us participate in the work that you're doing, and you make it visible to us, Lord. And that brings us great and exceeding joy, Lord, knowing that you've redeemed us, and now we get to serve you, Lord, and we get to see it, and it's visible, uh, Lord. So we give you praise and glory for that, and we pray that you would never stop doing it, Lord. We always want to see you work and speak to us, Lord. And won't you do that today as we read your word? Don't stop speaking to us, Lord, and give us something specific that we need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we come to you as your church today. You've uh, made us your church. You've put us together. We want to worship you and praise you. We want our words, um, our songs, not just to be songs, but to be expressions of our heart, expressions of our love, expressions of our honor to you, because you're worthy of that. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name today. Thank you for this day. Father, we lift up needs to you um, in our body. There's people that uh, just need your help in various ways, Lord. Help us right now to be able to focus in to do that. First, we give you praise and thanks. Thank you for Justin and Jessica's um, nephew, James, who uh, is doing well. He's going to be able to come home from the hospital after being born premature. And we pray you just continue to care for that little one. May he uh, just be healthy and strong, Lord. We thank you that he's uh, doing so well. We lift up those who are, are sick, Lord. Um, we pray for uh, Jason Strayer's family. Uh, we pray for Jack's, uh, Jack's mother. We pray that um, you should be with her, Lord. Just um, got diagnosed with cancer. And uh, we pray that your hand would be upon her, be, on, be on, upon the family. Be with Jason and Jack and the rest of the family. Help her to, to love her, care for her. We pray that she would um, see you um, through those who are uh, getting to, to serve her and care for her. Lord, be with, be with Jason especially and help him do that. We pray for uh, Diana Wood. Thank you for the good report that Patrick and Diana are um, doing well on their, um, as they left, uh, I don't know, about a year ago, I guess now, in, um, uh, in the military, and they get to come back to us in December. We're thankful for that, Lord. Uh, we pray for Diana, Lord. She has a benign tumor, tumor behind her eye and it needs to be operated on. We pray for a successful surgery. We pray for a healing of her body, Lord, that you would uh, prevent anything um, just that would impair her vision, Lord, um, from happening. Just keep her safe, Lord. We ask that in Jesus' name. We pray for um, those in our body who are in need of work. We pray for Garrett Foster, Lord. We pray you provide for him. And anybody else who uh, just needs, needs, needs work to, um, for their family and for themselves, Lord, we ask you to provide that. We pray um, for this, just this uh, accident. Um, this sad death of this young man, a 16-year-old man at, at uh, the lake this last week, Lake Taps. Lord, uh, be with his family, Lord. I, it's such a hard thing um, to lose a son. Lord, um, just bring comfort to that family. Bring comfort also to the, just the, the kids that were there with him. I um, uh, pray you'd bring comfort to them mourning they lost their son, the, the football team. Um, be with those who feel like they, they should have done something different, Lord. Help them to uh, just see you and only you can bring good from something that's so uh, just sad. Pray for that family. Lord, we lift up the mall outreach to you. Thank you that we have uh, people who continue to share your good news every week, Lord. Just the consistency of them. That's just uh, that's for here. Uh, we, we thank you that you put that on their hearts to do that. We pray for um, fruit to come forth, that, Lord, that the, the gospel will be planted and it would grow forth and be with Charles and Alan and just the rest of the crew that goes up there. Give them a great wisdom on how to share your good news. Lord, we thank you that you, uh, you brought Aaron home safely to us from Mexico. Thank you put that on his heart to do that. Um, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for Aaron, just uh, his desire to serve you with his life. We pray you to uh, just speak more things to his heart about what you'd like him to, to, do, to do next for you. Um, we lift up Patrick Wood to you, who's retiring from the military. Pray you'd be with him just in that transition and Help him, Lord, as he wants, to, he wants to serve you and he wants to be directed in the right path of that. Today, on this special day, we get to especially lift up all of our missionaries. Uh, we pray for a, a good dinner tonight, that uh, we have good fellowship, that all the details would work out of um, being able to talk to the missionaries. And thank you that Chris Rep's here today, Lord. We thank you for her and just all she does for you. How she uh, receive that call from you, and then sacrifices her life um, for, your, for your kingdom. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless her more and help her to do even more of that. Uh, we pray for um, just the little mission trips that are coming out here. We thank you for the Joshua family. Thank you for the trip that's going to go into Haiti. Um, we thank you that uh, you're putting on people, people's hearts in our, in our body just to do things. That's you that does that, and we're thankful for that. Um, and we ask that in Jesus' name. I guess the last one I'd like to pray just for Jason and Jackie and, and Yantu as they get to move t to Mexico, Lord, um, to take care of those orphans. Lord, we want to continue to pray and ask that those orphans would just 
latch on so firmly to the, the Jason and Jackie and Iyantu, and they would just be a, a family with Kim and Luis as well. And we're pride for all the details, the land, and a, and a, a building, and just everything. Um, pray you'd work that out according to your glory and your honor so we could praise you when we see it all happen. And uh, we lift up our children's ministry to you, the junior high group. Thank you for the, those kids, Lord. You've blessed us richly with many kids. and um, Pray the kids would take in your word, be filled with it. Um, it would take root and it would plant in their hearts that they uh, just would know you, the true and living God. And pray for the junior hires that um, Jason Murdoch and the team could beat them in just their, their place right now. Or junior high is just, uh, just a difficult age. Lord, we pray you'd help them there. And lastly, Lord, we uh, lift up our uh, worship to you in the form of our offering, Lord. We want to give um, as, we've been, as we've freely received. We want to give to you. We want to give, um, give in a way that uh, honors you, not uh, begrudgingly, not that we're, uh, but we want to give in a cheerful heart. And we want to give sacrificially, Lord, because we know it's so, your, your kingdom is so worth it, Lord. So help us to have that heart. We pray for the elders, um, those who are directing where the money goes. We pray for those who are spending the money in this church. Lord, give us wisdom on how to use it. And we pray you multiply our little for your much because we know you can do that. You can take the little we have and multiply it for your glory and your honor. We ask you to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for Blessings for praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, our lovely heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.
There is no doubt in our minds that you are holy, you're wonderful. We've seen it in your word. We've experienced in our life that you are holy. And we praise you, Lord. We worship you. We want you to be high and lifted up. We say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. We praise your name, Lord. Lord, be with us as we study your word, as we worship you and uh, just learning of you now. Thank you for this time to praise you through song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can find a seat. Good morning, church. Good morning. So we are uh, going to be picking up in Ephesians again. But first, we have uh, a little bit something special. Um, the Joshua family, um, who are right over there with their lovely daughters, they are going to be heading down to uh, Belize to serve down there. Um, the Lord put it on their heart, and they're just going to go for it. I asked Michael, how long did it go? And he said, seven weeks. And I was like, wow, they're going to be gone seven weeks. So we're going to pray for them this morning. Um, as you've been hearing from uh, some of you here, Joel um, and Denise Meyer, they sent out emails. It's a, it's a dangerous place. There's guns and you know, shootings and everything else. So we want to pray for their safety. But we also know that they're confident the Lord has them to do this. They're going to go out down there and serve the Lord. And the Lord's going to care for them and do exactly what he wants to do. So we want to pray that they have an effective work there. I'm going to invite Pastor Allen and the elders to come on up and the Joshua family. Get this beautiful family come on up. <laughs> they appear to be missing one daughter. Nap time, Nap time okay. <laughs> so, Pastor Allen, I'll lead us in prayer. You all join with us. Father God, we just want to give you praise this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for just the salvation of your son. Salvation that comes through him, Lord, and, and you've offered it to people from all the nations, Lord. Thank you for that. I thank you that you've commissioned us with the responsibility and the, the privilege of sharing just the gospel with those people, Lord. Thank you that you've put it on the Joshua's heart to go to Belize and share the good news with them, Lord. God, it's our prayer that you would go before them. Lord, we know, we know that you're already going before them, Lord. You've been planning this in their lives for years, and you're, you're just... You're just carrying out the next step of, of your plan for their life. And I pray that you would just clothe them with the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would equip them, Lord, 
to do the work of the ministry, the work of the church among the people in Belize, Lord, to support the work that's going on currently there, and uh, Lord, to possibly do, do new work to reach people who may have never heard the gospel before. Thank you that you've given Michael a real heart for evangelism, for sharing that good news, and Jill as well, and Lord, you've, you've given them a trust, a trust um, in their own lives and a trust in their daughter's lives, Lord. They trust you with the lives of their family. And I ask, Lord, that you would protect them while they're there, keep them safe from harm. As we know, it's a, it can be a dangerous city. But, Lord, you never said that serving you uh, would be easy, would be an easy thing to do, or it would be a safe or comfortable thing. So, Lord, as they step out in faith to follow your calling, to do your will and your work, I ask you would protect them, again, equip them, bring them back to us safely. And Lord, we look forward to just rejoicing with them in all the ways you're going to use them there and all the things you're going to do in their life. Lord, I pray you would take away any anxieties from the girls as they just do so many new things on this trip. First time on a plane, on a bus, in a hotel, in a third world country. And I pray you would just comfort their hearts, Lord Jesus. We ask that all in your name. Amen. So it's exciting to see just numbers of people in our church are just the Lord telling them to do something and they're stepping out and doing it. And so if the Lord puts something on your heart, step out and do it. He, he guides you. Just got Aaron back from Mexico. I want to hear how that went. And just neat people are doing that. We got the, talked about uh, Haiti. It's just it's very, very exciting. So let the Lord lead you and guide you into what he wants you to do because we're his church. We want to be his church. Before we get started, I, I, I guess I didn't I have to tell you a little story. Um, sometimes when we come to church, we uh, it kind of something happens right beforehand. So this morning, my wife was driving in, and she serves in the children's ministry. She has this big bag. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, and it has all of our supplies in it. And young family we have. And when she got here, the cup of orange juice had turned over inside of it and filled up the whole bottom of the bag. And so she kind of she had to clean all up in the back, and then she walked in here a little late. So. Sometimes when you come into church, you're just like, ugh. You know, and the enemy does that to kind of distract us. So if that's you this morning, pay attention real quick, because usually when that happens, it means you got something to tell you this morning. So be ready for it. So you can turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. And uh, if you need a Bible, the ushers are in the back. You can raise up your hand, and they will get one to you. Pastor Ron, as you know, um, he's in out doing the work of the ministry in Europe, and it's doing well. We're going to hear from him tonight. I guess what I want to say, though, to us, as we said last week, is we have the opportunity, as Pastor Ron's gone, to do the work that he's, the Lord's called us to do, that Pastor Ron's exhorted us, and I thank you, each of you, who have been, it's been very well since Pastor Ron's been gone so far. We, you guys are doing well. You're serving the Lord. You're keeping after it, and I encourage you just to keep doing that. If you see um, new people, you see someone who's hurting, anything, minister to one another, help each other, encourage one another, be the church. And also in that light, just know that the elders, uh, the pastors and leaders, the elders, they're here for you. You need anything, come to us. We'll pray for you, encourage you. Um, don't wait until Pastor Ron gets back. That just wouldn't be a good idea. Come forward and, and get some help, all right? Great. Well, we're going to be in Ephesians um, midway through. We've covered chapter 1 and half of chapter 2. And we saw last week that uh, Paul wrote the book, and he wrote it from where? Do we know? Prison. Good. He wrote from prison. And we know that he was um, writing to the Ephesian people, and also we talked about that he may have been writing as well to the area of Asia, which was his modern day, remember what that was? Turkey, modern day Turkey, and to a, a, a series of churches there, so he wrote that, but Ephesus being the, the church, or the, the chief city of that area. And he loved the people of Ephesus very, very much. He spent um, over two years there on one of his missionary journeys. Um, He said in Corinthians that a great and effective work was being done there when he wrote from Ephesus. He said that the gospel from Asia, or from Ephesus, went to all of Asia. People heard the message from there. And we saw the last 
sort of contact that Paul had with the Ephesians was when he, he went back through, and he didn't actually go into the cities, but he met with the elders, and the elders weeped over Paul because they knew that it might be the last time he would see them. So this is the body that he cares so much about that he wrote this letter to, and that's what we get to read and sort of you know, peek into, into this life. We saw last week that um, this is, the, the book is very deep. There's a lot of truths in it, but it's also very logical. The first three chapters we talked about, it's the doctrine of the church. And the last three chapters we talked about the duty of the church. The first three chapters we, talk, we, we, we sit at the Lord's feet. We take in the things that are the foundations of our faith. And the last three chapters we walk in these things. We learn how we walk them out. Next week we'll start to get into that. How do we walk them out? And then the last part we say we stand in these truths. So that's what we'll be doing. And we're going to pick up in chapter 2 in verse 11. And we can all stand and we'll read that together. Chapter 2, verse 11. It begins with, therefore remember. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Chapter 3. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ the gospel, of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, and depth, and height, to, the, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we ask that your word would uh, teach us and instruct us that as we cover these first three chapters of Ephesians, that these foundations, these principles, these truths that, are, um, that you've said about us, about your church, would be grounded inside of us, they would be rooted in us, 
that we would, um, from those things, go out and do the things you want us to do, to live for you, to, to honor, to glorify you. Lord, help us in that. We need your help. Guide us by your spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to pick up in verse 11. Um, last week we began doing all these P's, and we're continue that on. We saw in uh, chapter 1, we saw begin the prelude, and then we saw that we were supposed to be pray, we're a praise to God. Our lives are supposed to praise God. We were selected by the Father. We were saved by the Son. We were sealed by the Spirit. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're his children. Uh, we have an inheritance. Um, he's redeemed us by his blood. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. So he did these things in our lives. And then we saw Paul's first prayer. He prayed for us. Or, and he prayed for us, and he prayed that we'd have the knowledge of God. He prayed that our eyes would be opened, that we'd know the hope of his calling. We know the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and we know the exceeding greatness of his power. So Paul prayed that for, for us in his first prayer. We're going to read the second one today. Then we saw the position of Christ. Where's Christ seated? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. And he's seated in the heavenly places. He's above all, equal in authority to the Father. And then lastly, we saw in chapter 2, 1 through 10, we saw that we're our position in Christ, which he took us from death and brought us to life. He, by his grace and his mercy, not only is Christ seated in the heavenly places, it says that we're seated in the heavenly places with him. And he saved us by his grace. And we read that in verse 8 of chapter 2. It says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're saved by his grace. We didn't deserve that. We didn't earn it by works. It was through faith. And that faith itself was a gift from God. Why? So not that we boast, but that God gets the boasting. But it says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Here is poema, his grand design, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So we don't do works to be saved, but God has destined us, made us work it out so we would do works for him, a beautiful plan that he has laid out. Now, verse 11 of chapter 2, we begin, and it says, the first phrase, it says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh... We have to, we start out, when we're Christians, we have to continue to remember. We have to remember where the Lord took us from. Where were you back in the past? Um, I know for myself, I was, uh, I'd go through life, I tried to do well on things, and sports, and school, and everything, but it just got without purpose. Get up in the morning, go to school, maybe do some work, play some sports, have some dinner, go to bed, and do it over and over and over again. There was no purpose in it. I was always filled with lust at times. I know I was, didn't have love inside my heart. I couldn't love someone conditionally. And that's where I lived. But the Lord saved me and brought me out of that. And so when I remember on those things, I, I just I love him all the more. So it says, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. That's where we were. And in this case, we're going to be talking about Jews and Gentiles who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So in this time, at this, at this place, you have the Jews and the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the uncircumcision, the Jews are the circumcision. And Pastor Jason, if you were here on Wednesday, he taught us a little bit about um, circumcision, and he said, if you don't know what it is, go home and look it up yourself. And I'm going to say the same thing to you. But in any regard, the circumcision was, um, the, the Jews had received that as a promise. He had Abraham. He was in Ur of the Chaldees. He was an idolater. God called him out of there, brought him to the promised land, and he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to have, give you many children. And the sign I'm going to give you is a sign of circumcision. circumcision. All your males will be circumcised. And it was given to them. So now there was this, there was this uh, a division between you had the Gentiles, which were anybody who was a not a Jew, and the Jews who were circumcised. Uncircumcision, circumcision. And that's what we see here. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, the problem here was that the Gentiles, they didn't have all the, 
things the Jews received. The Jews received um, a promise of Messiah. They received that there would be a Christ that would come, and they looked forward to it. The Gentiles, they had that. They didn't have that promise. They didn't have anything to look forward to. They didn't have that Savior to come. It says you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They had no citizenship in, in, God's, in God's nation. They were without citizenship. They were on their own. It says that they were, um, so they're, they're aliens. They had no covenants of promise. The Jews, would, they received God's law, his word. And in his word, there was lots of promises and covenants for the Jewish people. For the Gentiles, there was none. They were without these. They had no hope. There was a lot of philosophers in this time, Greek philosophers and so on. They had a lot of philosophies how things were done and different ideas, but it lacked hope for the people. The, the people of God had a hope in God. And last thing, it says, without God in the world. Again, they had tons of idols, idolatry. You know, in Athens, we know that it even said Paul found this idol that was made to the unknown God, or you know, a statue for him. So they were without God. They didn't have the Lord. Now, this was the position of the Gentiles. The Jews, on the other hand, God's people, he had made them not just um, to be you know, his own people, but he, his purpose for the Jews for the circumcision, was to be a light to the world, to represent him to the world so people, the, the nations might come to him. It says in Isaiah 49, 6, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you, you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That was the Jewish people's purpose. And then in Zechariah 2, 11, it shows that eventually God would bring the nations to himself. He says, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in their midst. So God had pulled Abraham out of the early Chaldees, made him this nation so they could be a light to the world. But what happened? As the Jews went along, they began to have there be just a greater and greater division. They began to have some spiritual pride in them. So at the time of Jesus, then you know, it was even unlawful for to go into a certain person's house, to eat with them, um, to touch them, you become unclean. And so there was this great division there between Jew and Gentile. While the Jews had the promises of God, they had a spiritual pride. The Gentiles didn't have that, but they were without hope because they didn't have God at all. And so we have this great division. So if you're outlining this, we're in this first section. It's, the, it's peace over partiality from 11 through 22. Peace over partiality from 11 through 22. And in this first two verses, 11 and 12, we can call that alienated from God. So peace over partiality, 11 through 22. 11 and 12, alienated from from God. Now, here's the exciting thing, which is always great in the scripture when you see this. Verse 13, this next one we're going to say is access to God. 13 through 18, when we see this word, access to God, we see this word 13, but now, verse 4, but God, we saw it last week, but now in Christ Jesus. God takes that which is broken and brings life to it, brings, brings newness to it. But now in Christ. We've seen that over and over in Ephesians. This in Christ, all this stuff is related to being in Christ, being with Christ. But it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the Gentiles and the Jews, far apart, all people, but in Christ, brought, brought near by Christ's sacrifice for them, by his blood. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And they might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So now we see here, it says that Jesus came for himself and he became our peace. So had the Jews and the Gentile at odds with each other. Actually, words, uses the word enmity here. Enmity means like a, a hostile division between the two. There's an enmity between the two. Um, Gentiles, in, without God, in their sin. Jews, with God, having the law. But what do we know about the law? We know that the law only points to how we fail against, the, against God. How we, it's our tutor, it's our schoolmaster to show what we've done wrong. And so the Jews, though, having the law, they realized they couldn't fulfill the law. And the Gentiles without the law under sin, so they, both of them needed something. 
And that one thing that came was Jesus Christ. And he broke down the separation between them. He broke down the separation between um, all men and God. And he did that by dying himself and reconciling us to God. It says here in verse 6 that he might reconcile them to God, making that right. And it, what it says here also, which is pretty cool, is it says here, it says that he did that in one body. And he created a new man, you see in verse 15. So what is that new man? What is that one body? Well, that new man, that one body, first we had Gentiles, all people. Then you had Abraham come, you had Jews and Gentiles. Now you have this new man. And that new man, this new body, is the church. The church, God's great design, which he brought together that takes in Jews and Gentiles and all people, male, female, this church that she established to reconcile men to himself and men and women to, to each other. And this is a, just a, a beautiful, beautiful thing he did here. Um, there, verse Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10.32 says to show the different um, groups, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. We see the three here. We see Jews, the Greeks, or Gentiles, and the church of God. Now, how did he do this? Because there was this law that weighed on both, that they couldn't fulfill, Jesus Christ reconciled themselves by becoming a curse himself. Though the law put a curse on us, he became a curse for us. It says in Galatians 3:10 through 14, summarized, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And that's what he did to reconcile this group together. A sweet, sweet thing. Now, before we travel on to the next portion of it, I want you to note in verse 16 it says that he might reconcile them to God. Um, the word reconcile here, we're reconciled to God, but you know what else? We're also to be those who are ministers of reconciliation. You and I, once we become part of the church, we're supposed to reconcile others to God by declaring the good news to them, by being a witness to them. Um, first Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So you get to be a part of reconciling others to this new man, the body, bringing them to the church and with God, which is a sweet, sweet work that God has for you to do. Okay, um, verse 17 and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. So you who were afar off, meaning the Gentiles, the Jews who were near. We can see the same thing for us as far off, but he brought us to himself, those who are near. And then in verse 18 it says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Do you see that verse? It shows the triunity of God there. We see for through him, who's that? Jesus. We both have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit to the Father, or the, the triunity of God there showed in that verse in, now that, that brought us to the church, which is a cool, cool thing. Now, we just saw here, we saw alienated from God in the beginning. We just saw access to God. Now, before we move on to the next one, which will be abode of God, abode of God, I want to point out one thing. Some, nowadays, we don't really know the, the division between Jews and Gentiles. There are maybe a few of you are in here who are Jewish, but most of us are Gentiles. We don't know that distinction. We don't have you know, different places we can't go and not go, you know, and associate with one another. However, in the church at times, and in our hearts at times, there can be a partiality. And this partiality can, is on different, different lines. Sometimes it's racial. Sometimes it's between men and women. Sometimes it's rich or poor. Sometimes it's in schools that you know, one person's the jock and the other person's the good student. These, partiality, these lines of partiality. And the Bible, Christ died for all men. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what race you are, if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, it's died for all. And so for us to have partiality in our hearts, um, first, we know it's wrong, but also we need to examine ourselves at times because a lot of times when you have partiality, you don't actually even recognize it. So I would encourage us to think about those things. The church is for all. It's not just for a few. And we need to be inclusive of one another. Good? Amen. Verse 19 through 22, we see a boat of God. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 
So there's a, a new thing here now. Before in verse 12, what did it say? We were without Christ. It said we were alienated from God. It said we didn't have his covenants of promise. It said we had no hope without God. But now, in the end here, Christ did. We're now no longer strangers, foreigners. We're fellow citizens. We have Christ. We're in Christ. We're in Christ. We have a hope. What's that hope? The hope we talked about last week. He said, I want you to know the hope for your calling. We're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. There's a, there's a, a great hope there. We aren't without God. God is now our Father. We're part of his, his family, His children. What covenants do we have? Jesus made the new covenant when he died for us by his blood, and he gave us his new covenant in his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We have all these things. It is now in Christ. Exciting to see the difference, the two distinctions between the two. Verse 20, we're going to see this, uh, a new house he's creating. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So this is a foundation that's being built. And it was built on the apostles and prophets, um, and it, it's on their teaching. The New Testament, much of it, written by the apostles, declared by the prophets. It's building this, this teaching. What was the teaching about? It was about Jesus Christ and his gospel and his place. And they, they built this foundation up. Now, the important piece of the foundation, though, that never can be left out and is the most important place, and here it says chief, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Pastor Ron tells us a story, um, I don't know the last time he told us this story, but I just remember it very distinctly. He had some Mormons come to his house, and uh, they, they sat him down, and they had it they, on his kitchen table, and they, they put a chief cornerstone, a block, and they put some other blocks, and they called these the apostles and prophets, and they built the church on top of it. And then they went over and they said, now, we can take the chief cornerstone out, and look, it doesn't fall over. And that's ridiculous. We need Jesus Christ in the church, and the apostle and prophets with just them would be absolutely nothing. First Corinthians chapter um, uh, 30, verse 1. No foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to be all important to the church. It should be what we are about, who we exalt. He has to be our foundation. He's the rock on which we are laid. And so it says here, he's our chief cornerstone. Now, this is the cool part, though. So that's neat, but then he allows us to be part of it. And he says, In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The Jews would have known about their temple, right? Jerusalem. The Gentiles in Ephesus would know about the temple of Artemis or Diana. Physical temples didn't um, fulfill them. The, the, the glory of the Lord had departed from Jerusalem. Ephesus was a bunch of idols with idolatry. Here, God says, I'm going to dwell in the church. I'm going to build you into a spiritual temple. I'm going to use each individual person. I'm going to put them together. I'm going to fit them together and make this temple um, for my honor and my glory. And he does it. He builds them together. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 talks about the same thing. It says, coming to him as to a living stone. So Jesus Christ, the living stone. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also are living stones. So we're living stones. Are being built up a spiritual house. He's building the spiritual house. A holy priesthood. We get to be priests to our God. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So this is this beautiful thing. He's building living stones. Each of us are living. And one thing that's uh, very struck me very much about this. Uh, I heard a teaching from Pastor John Corson. And he talked about how each one of us, since we're living stones, and he's fitting this together, here it says growing us together, that at times we're going to rub on each other. And we're going to kind of rub each other the wrong way. We're going to bunch into each other. We're going to chip on each other. We're going to kind of, you know, cause trouble with each other. But the cool thing about that is that the way, that's, the way, that's what God uses to grow us up. To, we need to be refined, to be changed, to be molded a bit, to be fit together. And I would encourage us as a church, embrace one another. If someone rubs on you a little way, Work it out with them. Don't just say, you know, see you later, Rhoda. I'm going to work it out with them. Let them chip on you. Let them work with you. And then you both can be refined and grow up in what God you want you to be because we are his, his, his temple. That he lives inside of us. A very, very cool thing. So 11 through 12, 22 here, we see peace over partiality. And now we get to move into chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 1 through 13, we're going to see puzzle of the principalities. Puzzle of the Principalities. 
verse chapter 3, 1 through 13. And we begin in verse 1, and it says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Now, I want to pause here for a second, but just first, before I even do that, the verses 2 through 13 in your Bibles, um, mine actually has a dash right after verse 1. It's kind of a parenthesis. Paul's going to pray his, his second prayer in 14 through 19, but he, all of a sudden he just decides, I need to talk about the mystery of the church. And so he's going to talk about that kind of a parenthesis between 2 and 13. So we'll jump into that first. But in verse 1 here, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Where, where was Paul imprisoned? Probably in Rome. So it doesn't say Paul, a prisoner of Rome. It doesn't say Paul, a prisoner of Caesar. He says Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. And why, do we, why is that probably true? I can think of a couple reasons. So first, why is Paul in prison? Because he's taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And that was the one thing, whenever Paul was talking to any of the, any of the Jews, and as soon as he would mention he's taking the gospel to the Gentiles, they would get mad, they would get livid, and they, I mean, they, they want him arrested or, and, ki- and killed. So first off, Paul is arrested because of, the gen- of, of preaching Christ Jesus for the Gentiles. But the second reason I would say applies to us um, in particular is that Paul, he knew that where Christ Jesus had him is where he was supposed to be. We saw in verse 1 of chapter 1, or verse 2 of chapter 1, that he says, by the will of God. Paul was in the will of God. And he knew that if he was in Rome, it was because Christ Jesus wanted to be in Rome. He knew that if he was in the prison, he was in prison because Christ Jesus wanted him in prison. And so he embraced that. And he said, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus for that. Now for myself, um, th- what this spoke to me is that a lot of times I- I'd think, Lord, um, why have you put me here? It rains all the time. I kind of get depressed about it. I'm like, you know, it's, it, it's summer. It's not January. It's summer. And I, I kind of I, I feel bad about that at times. And I think, and I, the, then I realize and I think back and I say, Lord, you've put me here for a purpose and a plan. And who am I to say I shouldn't be here? I'm, I'm yours. I'm going I'm to live like I, I should be. I'm, I'm going to embrace where you have me. And I think we should all, whatever that thing is for you, we have to embrace if the Lord has you in a particular place, me moved you here, you don't necessarily like it, or this or that. We have to embrace where the Lord has the time and, and trust him for that. So it's a good, good exhortation to us. Verse 2. Um, from 2, all right, we can say 1 through 7, we're going to see um, mystery revealed, and then 8 through 13, mystery released. So 1 through 7, mystery revealed, 8 through 13, mystery released, all under the title of Puzzle of the Principalities. We're going to look at the mystery of the church here. Verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you. So Paul, his role was to be the apostle of the Gentiles. This word dispensation we talked about last week, it meant a stewardship or a period of time. And this was Paul's time when he was placed in this time to proclaim that men is saved, men and women are saved through grace, through Jesus Christ. And he's saying, that's what I am. I'm in this dispensation to give the grace of God to you Gentiles, which was given to me for you. Verse 3, how that by revelation, remember this is a, something that God, only God can reveal. It's hidden in him. He re- releases it when he desires it. Man can't figure it out himself. How that by revelation he made known to Paul, to me, the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the spirits, the spirits, the spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So he begins here and he says, there's a revelation that was given to him and it's a mystery and it hadn't been revealed ever before. And what is this mystery? What is this? It says in verse six, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So I don't know if you've noticed this before, but in the Old Testament, you can't really, you can't find the church. It doesn't tell us about the church. It was a mystery. Now we talked about last week, a mystery in this time isn't like a murder mystery. You want to solve who did the mystery. A mystery in God's, it's a, it's a divine secret. It's something that God keeps quiet until he wants to release it. And at this time, he's releasing this mystery that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, that there was Jews and Gentiles, but you didn't know this was going to happen. And now God says, this is the perfect time, my divine plan to do this. And he releases his mystery and he declares it to the apostles and the prophets that there would be this church which would bring one body to himself. 
And that's why he said, I believe he talked about it already. He's telling us a little more, as he talked about in the end of chapter 2. Then verse 7, it says, Of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given to me by the effective working of his power. So, a lot of times I think of grace, and I'm sure you do the same way, that we were saved by grace. God's grace saves us. But also, God's grace gifts us. And that's what Paul Harris says here. He says, God's grace gave me this gift. Um, three Greek words. The words in verse 7. Minister is the word diakonos, or what we'd say deacon. It means someone who fulfills the orders of another. He's serving other them. Paul humbly says, I'm a minister of the gospel. For, according to God, I'm, listening, I'm following his commands. And then he says, this gift I was given by his grace is the effective working. Effective working here is energia, and then of his power, dunamis. So God gave him a gift of grace. It was effective energy, effective working for the work, and it was with power. And this power we're going to see a little bit later is not just available to Paul, but this power is available to us too by God's gift and his grace to us. All right. We just saw mystery released. Now, mystery revealed. Now we're going to see mystery released. 8 through 13. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So is Paul proud about this? Is he puffed up? No. Paul's humble in this. He says, I'm the less than the least of all the saints. He says in another place, um, 1 Timothy 1.15, that he's the chief of sinners. Paul knew, he, remember we said remember, he knew where he came from. 1 Corinthians 15.9, he says, for I am less than the least of all the apostles. We have to be as ministers, as followers of Jesus Christ, humble before him, know where we came from. That's what he says. This grace was given, this great gift was given to me, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Remember last time Paul said he wanted us to, he prayed that we'd know the riches of Christ. Now he says they're unsearchable. So it's this paradox that as though we grow in knowing his riches for us, there is even more that's unsearchable to find. Verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So this amazing fellowship that's created between man and man and God and, God and man, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. That mystery that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament the the church has now been revealed. It wasn't revealed from the beginning of the ages through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember I told you that I felt without purpose at times. Our purpose now is not a temporary purpose. It's not even a purpose in one location. It's an eternal purpose. This eternal purpose is that the church, us individually as pieces of that church, to reveal to the principalities and powers, the angels and the demons, the wisdom of God. We have a great, great purpose, and that's to glorify him, to reveal his wisdom to the world. And it's, we, we know, I mean, I know, and we all know, that today there's a lot of philosophers, there's a lot of people, professors, people that talk, and the Bible says that they say the fool, that the cross is foolishness to man. The cross is foolishness to man. But the Bible says here, and what God says is that the church, him saving us all, is, reveals his manifold wisdom. And his manifold wisdom, the word manifold, means variegated. I didn't know what that meant. It means multicolored. It's like a tapestry, and it's just so diverse, and you can't search it out, and it's just amazing to look at this is God's wisdom that the church displays to the world by saving us. A really awesome purpose that you have for each one of you. Verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So, back at that time, we you know the Jews and Gentiles were separated, but think of the, their temple in, the, in Jerusalem. There was an outer court, an inner court. Gentiles couldn't make it in. And uh, they were separated there was, they found a couple different things in archaeology, some stones, and they were written on it at that location. It said, no foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So at that time, you couldn't even, the Gentiles couldn't even enter in. The Jews, only the priests could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Now it says we can go to the Father, boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. We can be with the Father. We can have boldness and access. Everybody, you guys know this book, verse Hebrews 4, 16. 
Let us there come, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you need help, you can come boldly to the throne of grace, God's grace and his mercy. A special promise for us. See all these promises we have? Verse 13. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Paul knew that his time in prison, being chained to a Roman guard, was nothing. It was like, this is no big deal. This is for your a far greater glory. And he said, you know, don't lose heart at my tribulation for you where I'm in prison. Be glad. And we should be glad as well. I mean, the book of Ephesus, or book of Ephesus, book of Ephesians, much of the New Testament wrote, written by Paul, and we wouldn't have received it unless he went through this for us. And the same thing is true for us. Um, where's that verse at here? 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says for us, for our light affliction, so the things that we're going through right now that might be troubling to us or trials, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The difficulties we're going through are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We have to think of our, of our lives in an eternal perspective to realize what we're actually going through is much greater, is much more involved, and we can glory in that. All right. Good job, everybody. Verse 14 through 19, we're going to look at Paul's second prayer. Paul's second prayer, and then we'll conclude with 20 and 21, which is postscript of power. But Paul's second prayer, verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So Paul's going to pray for us a second time, and he says that he bows his knee. Now, we know that the position of the body isn't what's the most important for prayer. Uh, we see in the Bible standing prayers, we see sitting prayers, we see Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane on his face praying. Um, but it's the position of the heart. It's a spirit of humility. And that's what Paul is showing here, the spirit of humility. However, I would say that when it says here they bow the knee, sometimes our, our physical position of prayer can help our heart be in the right position. So Paul gives us an example here that he bows his knee in prayer. And we should, we should bow our knees both physically at times and also um, definitely always in humility. He bows his knee before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now here's his prayer for us. This will be four parts, and it, each one comes to the next one. It builds upon itself. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. We have an, we have an inner man, we have a spirit inside of us, and our flesh battles against our spirit, and we need to be strengthened on the inside. We need to be strengthened. His spirit needs to strengthen our spirit in the inner man. And Paul prays that for us. We should pray that for ourselves. We should pray that for others. And how, how and why? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So we'll be strengthened in the inner man that we would have faith to believe that Christ truly lives inside of us. He lives inside of us. And we would believe that through faith because our inner man is strengthened. And we would know that. We'd know that he'd never leave us or forsake us. And then continue on, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So why rooted in love, like a tree rooted down deep, grounded like when a building is made, the foundation holding strong, that we be rooted and grounded in his love and love that he says that we know but then also that he says that it's passes knowledge. So again, this paradox that as we grow in it, we, we can't fully comprehend it. It's this growth process. Now, because he says that, though, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, um, I think there is a very, very key way to knowing the love of Christ. And that is looking at what he's done for us, his crucifixion for us. Verse up here, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus, in him. He died for us that we might receive his righteousness. He became sin for us. What, is the, what does it say? What is the width of his love? That he spread his arms on the cross and he showed us the width of his love. What is the length of his love? The Bible says he was crucified before the foundation of the world for us. I don't know how that all works, but somehow his sacrifice takes place beyond the foundation of the world. The depth of his love, that he would become sin for us, that he would go to the depth of our sin to become sin for us and the height of his love, that though we're sinners, 
He dies, rises again, and we get to be seated in the heavenly places with him, the height of his love. Pretty amazing that God's love, which is unsearchable, passes knowledge. Finally, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul wants us to be the fullness of God, not just partly. A lot of times we compare ourselves with one another. You know, he's, he's doing all right. I'm a little bit better than him, or she's this way. But God wants us to be the fullness of him, his fullness. We can pray for that. God, fill me with the fullness. I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to make it, but I want more of it, Lord. Fill me to your fullness. Okay, good prayer. Last two verses. 20 and 21, postscript of power. After going through these first three chapters, we see all these great truths that were the riches of Christ, his inheritance, our position in Christ, um, that were this mystery of the church, all these things. Paul just can't take it anymore. He begins to explode in praise. And he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly. We know that God's able, but he says he's able to do exceedingly. And he's not just able to do exceedingly, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly. And he's not just able to do exceedingly abundantly, but exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's what God's able to do. And how? It's like this power we talked about before, according to the power that works in us. The Holy Spirit inside of us can do things that we would never fathom that were possible, that he would want to do in us by his grace and his mercy. He does that. Paul's just, that builds up. He can do these things exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And then verse 21 is where he just breaks into praise. It says, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. His, amen. You ever say amen? Amen. amen. That's what his church is for, for his grace, his praise, and his glory to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to have the worship team come up, and I'd say just his first song, normally we come up for prayer, but we just, we, let's just worship the Lord. Let's, let's, let's praise him like it says here. Give him honor and praise with our whole hearts. Worship him with the song, and uh, just give him our praise and thanks. And then after that, we'll have a time for just coming up and receive prayer for any of your needs. Uh, we want to be here to pray for you. But first, I think it's just a good thing for us to, to worship God with our whole hearts because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly of all that we can ask or think. Lord, we thank you um, for your word. Help us to worship you now with our whole hearts. Um, we just saw over and over again your precious, great promises and how it caused Paul to just break out into praise. And we pray we would do that in our lives. We worship you now. In Jesus' name. God is able.
promise that we can cling to, that uh, it's a promise that gives us great hope, that we can trust you for all things, Lord, that you can do things um, by your grace and beyond what we can ask and think and see in the abundantly. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray for each person here, Lord, that you would um, speak to their hearts, that they would embrace the giftings, the grace that you give them, the callings you've given them serve you with their hearts. We pray for those who don't know you, Lord. They don't know you. They don't have that hope in you. We pray they'd be able to give their lives over to you. We would receive that hope, Lord, that times of refreshing would come upon them. Lord, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.